The energy norm can be used to define an uh, image condition for a acoustic wave field image. And the energy norm is actually quite general. It can be defined for not only for, it's not restricted to acoustic wave field, but uh, can be applied to any wave field at all, because any wave field has a measurement. We can measure uh, energy for any wave field, independent of, in, independent of the physics that it's involved. And we're trying to apply the same idea here, uh, define space-time vector fields that describe the wave field directionality in each one of the wave fields. For the last key case, we're going to have uh, an additional, uh, an additional uh, um, objective, uh, uh, additional component. In this case, it's the polarization vector. Uh, and and then, uh, based on these space-time vector fields, uh, define a dot pod between these vector fields, and then um, form an image in free of undesired artifacts. Let me show you here my motivation. So this is uh, my uh, VP velocity model uh, obtained from the MARMZ. And this is uh, smoothed quite a bit. And we can use this uh, velocity for migration purposes. However, this is not smooth enough. And smooth is a trick procedure because there is always a trade-off between resolution and smoothing. And here, I want to keep the resolution of this velocity model uh, while I'm uh, performing uh, elastic reverse time migration. As you all know, reverse time migration, when you uh, have velocity contracts, for the acoustic case, you're going to have backscattering reflections that cause uh, backscattering artifacts. And then, for the last key image, what will happen then if you use a uh, VP velocity like this that's not smooth enough and a similar uh, uh, S velocity, migration velocity as well? We're going to obtain this for a PP image. If you correlate the P wave mode from the source uh, wave field and P wave, and also the P wave mode from the uh, receiver wave field. We obtain this for a short migration. And here, as you can, as you all can see, uh, the backscattering artifacts are present in this image because of those velocity contrasts that I showed before. And not only that, we can also see. Um, other kinds of artifacts that are caused by wave fields of, uh, prop that propagate along the same path, which are dive waves, and also I'm including here in the direct waves. Therefore, I'm not filtering, filtering the direct waves from the recorded data at the surface here. Uh, if I stack these uh, overshots, this does not get any better. And here, uh, the best cat run effects are maxing most of the reflections in a shallow part. One can argue that uh, if you correlate uh, the same wave modes, so this also happens in an eventual SS image, therefore, uh, correlating the same wave modes is always going to obtain uh, backscattering uh, artifacts. One can argue that uh, if you use different wave modes, if you correlate different wave modes in a last image, uh, you Backscattering artifacts contained will be diminished. And let us see then an example of that. This is a shot for a PS image. Now we're using different wave modes, which means that uh, the backscattering events are not correlated because uh, we're dealing with different velocities for this uh, source and receiver wave field. However, we still have the uh, diving waves and direct waves that I'm not filtering again from the recorded data. And also, another problem arises for PS images, for imaging with uh, different wave modes, which is polite reversal. And probably we have seen the previous presentation from our colleague Yu Ting, where she explains better uh, this polite reversal and she proposes uh, other methods to deal uh, with this uh, problem. So as you can see here along uh, some refractors, uh, the polarity changes, and this for the azotropic case occurs at normal incidence. And because of that, 
every single shot will have a different uh, polarization from reflectors, which will lead to this stacked image that will not be constructed over shots. Okay, so my goal here, my objective here is to uh, seek for an image condition, a scaling image condition that has no backscattering artifacts, or at least those artifacts are attenuated, and, and has no polarity reverse as well. And we can obtain these using the energy norm, as you can see here by this image, this stacked image. And then we can notice that we have no backscattering artifacts. All the refactors here are very well seen because we do not have this low wave number artifacts that are present in the conventional images. And also, uh, no polarity reversal because we can see that the stacking was const constructed over shots. Let me show you how this is possible here. Uh, this is the energy norm for the acoustic case. And this is uh, very similar to the one that I showed in the morning. I just changed a little bit here the notation. And then we can also uh, derive uh, an energy norm for the last case. Here you can see that now for the last case, we, uh, this involves VP and VS velocities. However, the same, uh, this is derived from the same uh, energy conservation principle that you use in the acoustic case, and also uh, has separated terms for kinetic and potential energy. In this case, the kinetic, uh, the kinetic term is the, uh, the norm, the L2 norm of the, of the time derivative of the displacement vector. And the other terms here, the terms that are multiplied by the uh, VP and VS squared, Corresponding to potential energy of the elastic wave field. I want to um, explain a little bit better this uh, new notation here. Uh, it's a norm, as you can see, and it has a subscript of F, which means uh, I'm talking about a Frobenius uh, norm. And Frobenius norm, uh, it's defined based on the Frobenius product. Uh, whenever you have two matrices, if you um, some other products of the corresponding elements from each matrix, as you can see here by this formula, we obtain a scalar quantity. So it's basically in a product between uh, two matrices. And then um, this Frobenius product with the uh, Frobenius product of a matrix with itself, we generate the Frobenius norm. Coming back into our energy norm here, uh, as we all know, uh, a norm can be defined as an inner product of a vector itself. Therefore, we can define here an inner product between two wave fields. And here I'm using a color convention here, which is uh, blue for the source wave field and red for the receiver wave field. And let us analyze here each term here of this uh, inner product. The first one involves it's actually a dot product uh, between two vector fields, and each vector has three components. Uh, the second term, uh, it's a product between divergence, and then divergence, uh, it's, they are a scalar quantity. And here for the Frobenius product, uh, we are multiplying two matrix, and each one of the matrix in a three-dimensional experiment has nine elements for the gradient. Therefore, we can notice that uh, in total we have 13 components that are involved in this inner product, and then we, re we can rearrange them in this vector form here, in the same way that we did for the acoustic case that you can see in the top. However, uh, there's a, a huge difference here because the last case, for the last case, those vectors have 13 components. So the idea of orthogonality that I showed previously for the acoustic case will be harder to see. And then <coughs> redefining the inner product based on those vectors, we can uh, define an image condition that forms an image based on these space-time vector fields. Let us see then uh, for a simple experiment 
how this image in a condition works. As you can see, uh, I'm showing here a very simple model with a velocity contrast at 1.5 kilometers. This is, can be either in VP and VS or in both models. And we have a source at the center of this model and receivers everywhere on the surface. If we implement a uh, wave field imaging here and apply the image condition that I showed previously, this energy image condition, we obtain this image. And we can uh, see some features in this image. First, I'd like to highlight here uh, that we still have the fake mode artifact. And fake modes uh, artifacts, they are caused by uh, when you inject um, your recorded data as a displacement source, which means that uh, regardless of the data being uh, with a certain polarization, either P, either P or P or P or S polarization, the recorded data will be injected as P and S at the same time. And these will generate all, side, all sorts of artifacts that you can see here in this image. Another feature is that uh, this image condition has no polarity reversal, as you can see here by uh, what I indicate here in this image. However, we still have the backscattering artifact. And this is quite uh, expected because for the acoustic case, uh, the first formulation that we the first formulation that we did for the image condition, we also obtained backscattering artifact. And we had to do a slight modification in one of the vectors uh, to be able to uh, attenuate the backscattering artifact. And this gets even worse for more complex models, as you can see here. Therefore, I want to show you how I can do this modification for the elastic case. First, um, I'm showing here uh, for the acoustic case what we have done. Uh, we assumed first that the, the acoustic wave fields are composed of plane waves. And then, based on this, we can define an image condition that uh, can attenuate a certain reflection angle. And for the backscatter event, this scaling factor is exactly minus one. We can do something analogous for the uh, last case. However, I need to highlight here that for the last case, uh, the plane wave assumption uh, requires not only the slowness vector here, uh, which is uh, the P vector, but also the polarization vector. In this case, it's V0. And then we can apply this uh, minus sign in the time derivative component of this uh, box vector. Um, let me show you here uh, that this uh, approach of uh, apl applying this scalar factor really works and really uh, accomplishes the goal of uh, removing the backscattering artifact. First, let me go back to the uh, closed case again. Um, here I'm showing uh, the, the closed case, the dot product for the closed case, and when the wave fields uh, propagate along the same direction, which are characterized backscattering diving and direct waves, we end up here uh, obtaining the dispersion relation here. And then uh, we get a zero dot product for these vectors for these events. For the last case, we also get zero for wave fields that propagate along the same propagation direction and also uh, with the same polarization direction. And this is proven, uh, as you can see here, uh, the term is in the practice exactly the Christopher equation for the isotropic case. Therefore, it's proven that uh, for wave fields that propagate along the same direction and have the same polarization, we can attenuate these events based on this dot product. And then we can define these modified image conditions and each one of those image conditions in, in their environment, in the acoustic case and for the last case, attenuates the wave fields that propagate, they characterize the backscattering artifact. For the acoustic case, it was easy to show the orthogonality of these vectors, since they, are, uh, they have only four components. Um, 
for the acoustic case. However, for the last case, those vectors have 13 components. It's hard to visualize this orthogonality of, between these vectors. Therefore, I'm going to reduce uh, this to a very simple case uh, with a vertical plane wave source triggered at the origin of this system. And here we are actually um, in a 2D experiment with the time axis being, uh, uh, being plotted here in this figure as well. If we propagate forward in time this uh, source function, this plane wave source function, we obtain the following plot, uh, which means the evolution of this plane wave along the, the time direction. And therefore, uh, the wave field directionality is described by the two vectors that I'm plotting here. The thin vector represents the propagation direction, uh, which mathematically is described by the uh, slowness vector. And the thick errors here represent the polarization direction. Here, in this special case, I'm uh, using a pure S wave mode. And then if uh, we can do the same thing for the receiver wave field, which has a receiver at 5x equals 5 kilometers. And if we propagate backwards in time, we obtain this plane wave evolution over time. And then, uh, again, uh, the thick arrows represent the polarization direction of this plane wave. And the thin arrow represents the propagation direction. And the only difference from the source wave field is the direction of the propagation. Since we are, propagate, since we are extrapolating this receiver wave field backwards in time, this will be opposed to the source wave field. If we overlay both wave fields, we get this result. And then if we try to compute those uh, energy vectors, which have 13 components, a lot of uh, those components will be zero for this special case. And in the end, we only have three components. And these components uh, can be represented in this plot here. And basically, here I'm showing the cross-section between all of these uh, 13 dimensions that describe these box vectors. Therefore, I'm only sh showing here the components that are non-zero, which, for this special case, are only three. Let me show you here why they are perpendicular. Based on the definition of the box vectors for the last case, as I shown earlier, if you compute uh, each one of those components for this spatial case, when you have a S wave, plain S wave, you obtain the following numbers here in the components. The spatial, uh, the second component here, it's, uh, I want to highlight here because it actually makes sense because you have uh, their versions of the wave fields in the second component, and it's a zero as we're treating uh, the S wave only here. As you all know, the S wave has, uh, if we have a wave field that has, has polarization only on the transversal direction, the divergence will be zero. And if you compute the dot product, as expected, it will be zero for wave fields that propagate along the same direction. Let me show you here another, uh, the same special case, but now I'm gonna talk about uh, P wave polarization. Uh, if you propagate this plane wave uh, over time, uh, this projection will be, uh, the, the P plane wave will arrive at earlier time compared to the S, wa S plane wave. And we have the same, uh, the following polarization vector in propagation direction. The same happens with the receiver wave field. If you propagate backwards in time, obtain this evolution of the plane wave. And then, uh, again, the thin arrow represents the propagation direction, and the thick arrow represents the polarization direction. Overlaying this uh, to a schematic representation of the wave fields, we obtain this. And if you compute those energy vectors again, uh, we, we obtain, we find out that they are also orthogonal. And I can show this again with the, showing again the definition of the box vectors for each wave field. 
And then uh, if I compute them, there I have the following values here. So in this case, uh, this, these energy vectors are more complicated than the uh, S waves that I shown previously. And the dot product between uh, these vectors in this spatial case will be zero for wave fields that propagate along the same direction and have the same polarization. Uh, let me show you how now how the image will look like if you apply the image condition this way with this modification. Here you can notice that we have no polarity reversal at normal incidence. We also have no more backscattering artifacts as well. And then we can show this for a more complex model, in this case Marmosy. Here I'm showing the shots over a couple of shots here. And if we stack over shots, we obtain the image that I showing in the beginning of this presentation, which has no backscattering artifacts and has no polite reverse as well. Uh, summarize this image condition. It's again based on the energy norm, but however, for the last case, and uh, the meaning here is that it's related to the energy transfer between source and receiver wave field, since it's derived from uh, an energy measure, and we find that uh, its implementation is fast and robust, since it only needs the derivative of the wave field. Uh, it does not require uh, Helmholtz decomposition, and also it does not require any additional information, any geological information, for instance. And the benefits, as you can see by the images, uh, this image condition has no polar reversal at normal incidence, and also shows no backscattering artifacts. Um, so the energy norm, as you can see, it's uh, very broad since it, uh, it was applicable to the acoustic case and also for the, this elastic isotropic case. However, we believe that uh, we also can extend the same concept for an isotropic case since uh, a wave field that propagates, that propagates on anisotropic models, we can also measure uh, uh, content of energy of those wave fields. And if we define an energy norm for those wave fields and also following the same strategy and also develop an image condition for, uh, for these anisotropic wave fields. Thank you all for your presence here.